Testing, 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 testing. Testing, testing. Well set. Yep. Turn around. <clears throat> Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you, Lord, for blessing us, and saving us, and loving us. And Lord, thank you that uh, you've given us this opportunity to offer the praise or lift to you. And now, Lord, we ask that you open the eyes and ears and hearts of our understanding that we may receive more of this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 I'm going to start off with just a kind of like a, a rather, uh, I'm talking about codes today. And I'm going to do a code now to my best nurse out there. 82 over, 86 over 62. That's it. That's a code. <laughs> now, um, uh, we're going to talk about your death today. Everyone here is going to die, me and Chloe. Mm -hmm. That's a transition. Okay, uh, it's like a uh, like a plant that dies. Well, it transitions, okay, into something else. Food usually, if it's a wheat, or or poison, if it's a tear but it transitions into something else. We're all gonna die. Today's, the title of today's message is a metaphorical de depiction of your grave. Metaphor means showing something and saying, that's really not what I'm meaning, that's just a seed. The fruit of what I'm meaning is an abstraction based upon that the characteristics of that particular seed. If that sounds kinda complicated, it kinda is in a way. A metaphorical description depiction of your grave. Now, the first thing I'm going to say is this. Who wrote this metaphorical description of your grave? And guess who did it? God. It's in the Bible. It's God. Who wrote this? It's God's thoughts. Okay? And he, what he's describing, I'm going to be telling you as we go. This could get very complicated but because I'm going to be talking about lots of things you don't understand. But just, just sit, bear with it. We're going to talk about your grave when you die. Okay? So this is something that God's given us to understand if we can. And understanding comes from building up block of understanding upon understanding, revelation upon revelation upon revelation upon revelation, and you have understanding. Okay? Uh, however, I dealt with this in my first, I think I was uh, a year saved, and, and I, I started dealing with the tabernacle of Moses because I could see right even then God led me to see that that was a really important function. Let me say, I will repeat for you this. At Mount Sinai, we're all familiar with Mount Sinai and God appeared on, on top of Mount Sinai, right? In the Old Testament. Then he had thunder and lightning and all this stuff. And he gave out uh, the two tables of testimony. That's the Ten Commandments, right? We all know that. It's the thing that we don't, is not preached in the schools. Is, yes, that's what God did, but he also did something else. He did two things, not one. He gave us the pattern of the tabernacle. Ooh, when did he do that? Right on Mount Sinai, when he gave you two Ten Commandments. Well, you mean so that's equally, at least equally as important as the Ten Commandments? Yep. He gave us the Ten Commandments in reality, which will kill you if you disobey them. And he gave you the tabernacle of Moses, which will save your life if you understand it. So, we're going to talk about that today. So it sounds pretty heavy ready, right? It's going to get a lot heavier. A, met a metaphorical depiction of your grave. And we're going to start right off uh, saying this in subtitle, Words Symbolize Thoughts. All words, this whole Bible here is full of words. Those are words <clears throat> aren't what God really means. What comes out of those words, the thoughts are, that they symbolize is what God means. Okay, so words symbolize thoughts. These are all the thoughts of God symbolized by words, words that we can understand. Words are symbols of communication. God communicates through these words to us because he can't communicate to us directly. How come? Because we still have sin in our lives, every one of us. And that means, puff, just like that, we're gone. As soon as we're, we, <laughs> God, appears, God appears to us, bang, we're, I mean, if we're in front of God, we're gone because we have sin in our lives. When we're sinless, then it'll be a lot different. Then we'll be walking with God, like Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. Okay? But when they became sin, they couldn't walk anymore with God. All right? So, so we continue now. 
Words symbolize thoughts. Words are symbols of communication. We start with Exodus chapter 25, verses 1 through 7. I'll read the blackface first. That's what's in the Bible. <clears throat> and then we'll talk about the interpretation. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. This is the offering which ye shall take of, of them. He's talking now about you folks, disciples. This is the offering which ye shall take of them. Gold and silver and brass, these are all symbols now. They all have individual meanings. Gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red, which obviously is the blood, okay, and badger skins and shitham wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing the oil and for sweet incense and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. Now, all those things that I mentioned to you are symbols. That's not the reality. The reality is actually heavenly. They're symbols of something that's heavenly, okay? So, and I don't understand all the symbols, but I understand some of the symbols, and with enough symbols so that we can, we can interpret and go. So let me just read this with my interjections now. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they, that's us, that they bring me an offering. An offering in the Hebrew means a present, especially in a, as a sacrifice or as a tribute, a gift. We're supposed to be giving God something back, okay? A gift, an offering. Bring me an, uh, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly. That's important. It's willingly. Very important. And that means in Hebrew to volunteer as a soldier, the volunteers for service, okay? Uh, to offer self, to offer something representing yourself like the like the uh, the animals that they offered for sacrifice in the tabernacle were representations symbols of their own selves that they sacrificed okay bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart that is with understanding and wisdom if you're just giving it because everybody else is doing that and whatever and you don't have any understanding then that's really doesn't mean anything to God everyone everyone does it willingly with his heart he shall take my offering. And this is the offering which he shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shitham wood, oil for the light, spices for anoint the anointing oil and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones set to be set in the epod, that's the vest, in the breastplate. And these stones were that they're referring to are the Urim and the Thummim which is a very, well, anyway, the Urim and the Thummim, okay, let's look at Exodus 28, uh, footnote, Exodus 28, verse 30, see what the Urim and the Thummim actually are, okay, represent. They're stones, okay, and what they did is they, that what, they, what the priest did is they used those stones to make final decisions about things. They would cast the stones for lot, okay, and they would take whatever the stones came up to be a yes or no answer or an answer to their uh, their questions. They realized they couldn't make decisions themselves without God's guidance. So they used the Urim and the Thummim, holy instruments, okay, to make those decisions, help them, suggest them, tell them what decisions to make. Okay, Exodus 28, verse 30, and thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment, it's judgment now, the Urim and the Thummim. Now the Urim in the Hebrew means flames, it means lights, and the Thummim in the Hebrew means perfections. Lights and perfections. Lights and perfections, okay? Now you compare the lights and perfections to the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. That's what we're really talking about symbolically the nine, in the New Testament, the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. God gives you those gifts to make judgment calls, to, to, to do the things that, that those gifts, gifts are designed for you to do, okay? That's the Urim and, Urim and the Thummim. That's the Urim and the Thummim in the New Testament the Old Testament, it was represented by stones that they, that they used for judgment, okay? So let's just leave that now because that was the opening, all right? Then we go to the next verses, Exodus 25, verses 8 and 9. We already did Exodus 25, verses 1 through 7 just now as the opening. Now we'll look at Exodus chapter 25, verse 8 and 9 because it starts to deal. This is subtitled here, The Ark of Your Testimony Has Been Found. It is in you. 
The Ark of the Covenant <clears throat> has been lost in terms of the Bible. It kind of just disappeared out of the Bible. It went away. Uh, I can't remember. Someplace, sometime, I think, uh, in the terms of uh, uh, King David in his time or toward the end of his time, it disappeared. In any case, the Ark of the Covenant is gone. And currently, and for years now, the Jewish leaders in Je Jerusalem uh, currently uh, have been searching for the Ark, and they think they found it underneath the temple someplace and uh, uh, are going to restore it. Uh, but uh, that's all fantasy. They don't really realize what they're doing either. All right. So let's talk and look and see what, what God's talking about here. Okay. And I'm saying to tell you this, the ark of your testimony has been found. It is you. You are You are the Ark of the Covenant. Covenant is agreement. It was agreement between God and men. So we have found the ark, believe it or not. <laughs> if there was some understanding out there, this is going out uh, on a, a, a video to all the, all the world, okay? If they would just, uh, well, God's revealing things in these last days to those people who have ears to hear. Okay, so now let's continue with it. Now let's just look at this. I had subtitled this, the ark of your testimony has been found, it is you. It is called the Ark of Testimony. What does testimony mean? Speaking forth, what are you testifying? Testifying of God, God's will, his works, what God wants, okay? That's the testimony. It's the Ark of Testimony. It's, it's called the Ark of Testimony and it's also called the Ark of, Ark, Ark of the Covenant. Same thing. Let's look now, Exodus 25, eight and nine. And let them make me, he's, 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 he was done speaking about uh, the Urim and Thurmans over in Swanee went and said, let them um, uh, make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof. Even so, ye shall make it. Again, God gave us two things on top of Mount Sinai. He gave us the law, which will kill you, and he gave you the pattern of the tabernacle that's in heaven, which will save you. So now look and see this now. So we start with again. It says, and let them and let them accept those free will offerings, the free will offerings, and symbols, and make me a sanctuary. So God wants His disciples to make Him a sanctuary. Okay, uh, what is a sanctuary? First footnote: a consecrated thing or place, especially a palace, a chapel, a holy place, or a holy person. Let them make me a sanctuary that, my, that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle. And let's look at the second footnote, what it means by pattern. A, a, after by the, the structure, by implication, a model, resemblance, resemblance, figure, form, likeness, similitude. And so after the pattern, as symbolic now again, he's saying he's going to give it to us in symbolic form. He wants you to understand it. If you don't understand this, when we get done, <laughs> well, we'll continue. According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle, uh, okay, let's see now what tabernacle means. Third footnote in the Hebrew, it means a residence. This is quite interesting. What it means is, this, uh, this is according to Strong's exhaustive concordance, it means including a shepherd's hut, the lair of animals, the grave. Oh, wait a minute now. Let me just get this. Equals a shepherd's hut. Is that good or bad? Well, that's good, of course. To give, to give the shepherd uh, cover and, uh, uh, and uh, warmth, and it's good. 
It also mean, it can, can mean, can mean both. It also can mean the lair of animals. Oh, is that good or bad? Doesn't sound too good to me. Lair means the den, okay, and it has a negative connotation. So, so what, what we're saying, what God is saying here to tabernacle means, can mean two different things depending on who you are. Ooh, yes, okay. And figuratively it means the grave. It means a shepherd's hut, a tabernacle, and both of those go to the grave. Oh, that's what we're talking about. This right here, uh -huh. this whole structure. And most particularly this section here. The grave. Well, how is that possible? Now, let's, let's, it says, uh, uh, figuratively, a residence, including shepherd's hut, the lair of animals, figuratively, the grave, a dwelling, a habitation, a tent. A uh, tabernacle, the word appears 328 times in the Bible. I have here, parenthetically, the grave, that's the tabernacle, and the coffin, that's the ark. Whoa, I haven't gotten to what the ark means yet, but I'm giving a little heads up. The grave is the tabernacle. That's this whole thing here. That's the tabernacle, okay? And what is inside that tabernacle is this little box over here, way in the back. Rectangular box. And he's saying, this is the grave. This whole thing is the grave. And the ark is here inside that. And the ark is a coffin. What, 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 what's going on here? Notice we got, because he's given it two ways. He's given us positive things and negative things. So let's continue now. He says here, And I will show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. The instruments are something, in the Hebrew, instruments are something prepared by God, any apparatus, furniture, tools, etc. Okay? Now, that means that this uh, brazen altar sacrifice and uh, the brazen labor and uh, the showbread and, and uh, 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 all this, it does these are all instruments, the furniture, okay, uh, given by God. So what it says here, and the last, last footnote is this, uh, even so shall you make it, number five, and I'm taking you all the way from the tabernacle in the Old Testament, I mentioned now, 300, I said 328 times, okay, to the New Testament. We're going right to the end of the New Testament. Last time, it's, it's only mentioned twice in the book of Revelations. The last time it's ever mentioned is in Revelations chapter 21. So let's see what that means, last time it's mentioned, okay? Re Revelation 21 is the second to the last chapter in the Bible, okay? Okay, I'll read that, Revelation 20, number 5, 21, 1 through 4. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. The end of it all. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That's Christians who are the bride of Christ, okay? And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. That's the end result of all this. God's going to come down and dwell with us, in us, okay? Now, it says you're the tabernacle of God. You know that we call us the tabernacle of Moses. Everybody calls it the tabernacle of Moses, that's what they talk about. But it's never mentioned in the Bible as being the tabernacle of Moses. Not ever. The only time it's been addressed to a person is right here. It's the tabernacle of God. It's the tabernacle of God. Only time in the Bible. So all this time, and I could call it myself a tabernacle of Moses because that's, that's the conventional way of doing it. All right, so what we're doing here is we're seeing that we had for definition of a tabernacle, the grave. Now let's continue with the construction of a tabernacle. Do you know that from beginning to end, how, how long the, the, the construction of a tabernacle took? Nine months. Wow. Nine months, isn't that kind of strange? Yeah. Because what happens is in typology, this whole structure is the body of Christ body of Jesus Christ. Remember, if I put this vertically, I've got, I've got uh, uh, sides here, and ribs here, ribs here, and a thigh here, and a thigh in the back, and shoulder up here, and shoulder up here, and I get into that 
where the, the words uh, for side have all these different uh, meanings of the, of, of the body. And then Jesus comes down and meets us as we're rising up. So anyway, so it's the body of Christ. And what did we, what did we find how long it took to construct it? Nine months. Now, isn't that kind of coincidental? <laughs> All right. Let's read on now and see this thing about the construction. This is Exodus chapter 25, verses 10 through 15. And they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. Now, wait, we'll stop right there. And they shall make an ark. Well, let's find out what an ark really is. Let's look at the first footnote. In the Hebrew, an ark has the sense of, in, 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 the, in the sense of gathering, okay? The ark is a box. In, in the Hebrew, Strong's definition, it's a box, it's a chest, it's a coffin. And it comes from the root word, which means to pluck, to gather. It's like the Feast of Tabernacles. At the end is the last feast. It's the Feast of Engathering of the Fruit. We are the fruit. But going back, okay, it is, a, uh, so what, uh, now what it is, is when it, when it says here, uh, the, it's, uh, the box, in the, by definition, is a box, a chest, or coffin, I have added there, in my own italics, a treasure chest. What kind of a chest could it be? Well, if you're one of the good guys, and the tabernacle is, is a hut, because you're a shepherd's hut, okay, and the ark is a treasure chest, not a coffin. And when, if you're one of the bad guys and you're not saying you're born again, guess what the ark is? It's a coffin. Okay. So I had here some, some measurements, and they get a little indefinite. Uh, they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Uh, uh, shittim. Let's look at what shittim, what kind of wood that is. In the Bible, men are trees. All the way throughout the Bible, men are trees, okay? Is it, it is not coincidental that in the Bible, in the beginning, in the, uh, the Garden of Eden, we have trees. Yeah, trees. Trees, right? So, so those, all those angels we're talking about in the beginning are trees. Because that's what it is in heaven. The angels are represented as trees. Uh, Jesus Christ is the tree of life, and, and uh, Satan, uh, uh, Lucifer, Satan is a, is the tree of the of the uh, knowledge of good and evil, and the rest of the trees around are all trees. Okay, so we have trees in the in the Bible in the in the Garden of Eden. Those represent angels. Okay, and so what what, uh, what we have here is now that the that the ark itself is made out of wood. Okay, it's made out of the sticks of wood. The acacia tree. Our case are from scourging thorns. Thorns, thorns, thorns. That means this. I come up to you and you're not saved. And I say, let me tell you about Jesus. Hey, yeah, get away from me. Ah, you, know, you, you, this, that, so Have all kind of problems. You know, you have thorns, thorns, thorns. All over you. Even now you have thorns. Even my, my staff, is, my staff are just like a normal uh, church ga ga gathering. Okay, uh, they got thorns too. Some have fewer thorns than others. The more you have, what Jesus Christ did, he was a carpenter. He worked in wood. Not a coincidence there either, okay? He worked in wood. And he took, would take and cut down a tree, and Jesus does that. He chops off, severs it from the world. That means he saves it, all right? And he brings it, and then he starts fashioning it, and he gets rid of the thorns first. All the thorns. Some of, some of my staff have lots of thorns still, and some, have, some are getting, well, they're all getting less and less as they progress with the Lord, getting more and more of God, you get less and less of Satan, because that's what you're starting off. When I was an unsaved guy, I was 100% Satan. That's who I listened to. That was the world, okay, because he's the God of this world, the Bible says in Corinthians. Now I listen to God. Of course, I've still got Satan yammering at me as well, okay, but I got thorns, 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 thorns. God's taking away those thorns, little by little by little. Taking away those thorns. That's God, as uh, Jesus Christ, I should say. So it's, it's shit, so the ark is made out of shit and wood. That's people. That's you. What Jesus has done is he's taken the shit and wood. He's gotten rid of all those branches. The branches are false doctrine this way, false doctrine this way, so on, so on and straighten you up, made you into a plank, a board. Okay, and. Uh, uh, well, for example, he used you in the tabernacle of Moses. 
or it's not called tabernacle Moses, it's tabernacle for God, but these, all these, these boards here are to shut them wood. Okay? They used to be thorny trees. And now they've been <laughs> separated from the world, the roots still in the world, but the tree is, is essentially a, a spiritual, it's in heaven, okay? And, and uh, we have, uh, they're all straightened up and all the thorns are gone. These are priests, they represent priests uh, in the tabernacle of, Mo of Moses, we'll call it that. So, understanding that the ark is made of the water is really important because what that means is, you are it. And it was, it was uh, two cubits and a half in, uh, I'll show you the length thereof, and a cubit and a half, uh, the breadth, the width of it, and thereof, and a cubit and a half, the height, and inches. So, let's just draw. A tabernacle. Now, proportionally speaking, nobody knows what the, those cubits actually were. Uh, the, the scholars say that uh, the cubit was the, the length of from your elbow to your tip of your finger, which means your furthest finger out. But that varies a lot, and uh, we don't know. Lots of times, in fact, uh, almost every time in the Bible, I can't think of a time when it's not, when a measure is not how is it conceivable? It's like indefinite, like a cubit. Nobody knows what it means. It's a representation of the Holy Spirit. Because that's the Holy Spirit, you see. And we can't conceive of all the, all, all the Holy Spirit. It's, it's beyond us at this point in time. So, but anyway, we'll just let that fly. So what we're looking at here, the, the, this tabernacle, or this ark. And what is the ark again here? What does it say? Where will I go? The ark is a, either a treasure chest or a coffin. Okay, but the ark is made out of shit and wood. You and me, that's you and me. We're each an ark in ourselves. That's us here. Now we're in the furthest place in the tabernacle. We're right here. This, uh, uh, right here. Okay. And what happens? Okay, and thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length of it. Oh, I went, I went to that and something. I'm going to back up a little bit. Oh, I'm over here. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder where I was. Okay. okay. So what will happen is this. We'll continue with where we were. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. Now, listen to this. Thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. Not gold, because gold can be used. It's the only metal that can be used in its original form. You can pick up gold in the ground, and it's malleable. So you can, move, not with your fingers as much as, well, you can if you just have a lot of pressure, but it's malleable. You can use it in, in different ways. But pure gold is pure, okay? And what's it saying here? Thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, gold is pure. It's a pure metal. It represents God. Gold represents God in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, blood represents Jesus Christ. But in the Old Testament, Gold represents God. And we're going to take this, this wood structure of you and me and we're going to cover it with gold. Cover it with gold? Let's look at that again, what that means here. Okay. And thou shalt cover, overlay it, cover it with pure gold. And gold means, in the Hebrew, means to shimmer. To shimmer. It's like going out in the desert and you see <coughs> a shimmering of, uh, uh, in the air. That also is the Shekinah glory. The Jews call it the Shekinah glory of God. Okay? That means it would cover with pure gold, within and without. Oh, that's important. What it means is, we're just not going to take and cover the outside with God. With God. We're going to cover the inside, too. Ah. You see? That's what's happening to you who are saved and born again, you're being covered not only from the outside by God, but on the inside as well, in here. So everything is covered. So there is no wood exposed at all, because wood represents sin, actually, okay? That's our, our human body. But it is covered, encased in gold. Most importantly, not just outside, which you would normally think, but inside and outside, he's in us, okay? 
and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, within and without, and thou shalt overlay it, and it shall make, make upon it a crown of gold. Oh, and also, there's a crown of gold round about it. We get a crown. We get a crown. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof. And the two rings shall be in, in the one side. You know what that means in Hebrew? Ribs. That's this side. And on the other, this is the long side. This side, ribs. Okay. Remember I told you about that word ribs. 27 different meanings in the Bible. Hebrew meanings. Whoa. Okay. And, and the two rings shall be in the one side of it and two rings in the other side of it. So it had a ring in each each of the four corners. Okay. I, can't, I, can't, I don't do well in that kind of a thing. But anyway. That's a conception. Why are these rings are their golden rings attached to it? Why so? And thou shalt, and here's why. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold. Staves. What is a stave? A stave is a long pole. A long pole. What we're going to do is we're going to stick those long poles into the rings so that the, the priest can carry the, carry the tabernacle, carry the uh, ark, I would say. Okay? Uh, yeah, like this. Ring. ring. Just, just, we'll just look at the profile one side, but there's another ring on, on uh, either end, uh, uh, other side uh, there as well. And what the priests do is they would put these long poles through here. What are the poles made of? Shit and wood. What did a shit and wood represent? Men. Oh, priest. Because they're the ones who have to carry the, carry the, uh, carry the load. It's the priesthood who did this. And that's how they would carry this ark around. They would put staves in, in, in on both sides and they would carry it around. And that's what the priests do, don't they? Mm -hmm. They carry the Word of God around. That's what I'm doing today. I'm carrying the Word of God. Let's continue. Okay. Okay. Thou shalt make, and thou shalt make staves. And in, in, the, in, the, in the Hebrew, that means separated. And that's what they are. Priests are separated from the unsaved people. Definitely separated from unsaved people, okay? It means separated by implication. Here it is. In the Hebrew, it means by implication, a part of the body. Here we go again. A part of the body, a branch of a tree. A part of a body. That was in Hebrew. Here we go with the body again. Okay? And I have here priests, ministers, and pastors. That's what that represents. Okay? You should make those staves of shit to wood and overlay them with gold. They're covered with gold too. God. They're covered. All right? And thou shalt put the staves in the rings by the sides of the ark that the ark may be born with them, where the priests are carrying the ark. Okay? Just like that's what I'm carrying, in that sense of the word, I'm carrying this congregation uh, through God's word. Okay? The staves shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. Ever. I have ever as my own thing. It's permanent. They're not to be taken out. Lots of pictures of the ark showing the staves being removed. They're not being removed at all. Okay, they're, they're there forever. That's just an error that people make, not reading it right. Okay, we'll go to the back side. Now, did God put these things into the ark, which is the either the treasure chest or coffin? And to you who are sitting there right now and listening to me, this ark is either to you, we're talking about it's either a treasure chest or it's a coffin. And guess what? If it's a coffin, it ain't covered by gold. It's just bare wood. We'll continue. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. So what God is going to do is he's going to put God's own testimony of everything about him inside the ark. That's of a saved person. 
okay, of a saved person. You're not going to put it inside of an unsaved person because they wouldn't understand it. So let's just look and see what that means. A commentary upon that. Uh, footnote number one. Upon the completion of the building of their tabernacle, again, it took nine months, God put into the Ark of Testimony, that's the covenant, the testimony of the two tables, that's the Ten Commandments, which represent God the Father, and he put in the golden pot of manna, representing God the Son, Jesus Christ, and he put in Aaron's rod that miraculously bit it, budded, representing God the Holy Spirit. Those three things are in the Ark. Now, I'm going to show you that they are in a moment, but let's just put them in here. There's three things inside this Ark of, an unsa of a saved person that is a treasure chest. First thing is he put in, what well, he put in, he two tables of testimony. That's in the Bible, okay? Uh, that's in our second footnote. It, it itemizes though. Uh, we're in, uh, we're in the middle of it. We're inside, inside the Ark of the, Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of Testimony, was a golden pot of man, a golden pot that had manna, uh, an Aaron's rod that budded, and the two, uh, two tables of covenant, okay? But I'm going to show you them right now. Here's the, uh, what he put inside here. Ten, ten, the Ten Commandments, and he also put in a, a, and he put a little pot of manna, and also put in Aaron's rod. So these are the three things he put inside the ark, inside the ark of you. If you're saved and born again, he put in the Ten Commandments, golden pot of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. What do those represent? Because this is the ark of testimony. Testimony means to speak forth, speak out. God is speaking out and saying, "This is my testimony. This is what I put inside of you when you got saved and born again." I put in the Ten Commandments. Who does the Ten Commandments represent? What well, represents Father God? Yep. Okay. God. He put in the golden pot of manna. Well, Jesus Christ said, I am the manna. Okay. He rep that represents Jesus Christ. And he put an Aaron's rod that budded. Aaron's rod miraculously budded. It, uh, it was a... Uh, it was just a dead rod, and overnight it sprung forth fruit, okay, uh, a good fruit. Aaron's rod that budded, that's why it was a miracle, okay, so that's the Holy Spirit. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. If you're saved and born again, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you also receive the, the, the Holy Spirit and, and Father God. They all dwell in you. That's the testimony. This is the Ark of Testimony, the Ark of Covenant, the covenant between God and us. It's also called the Ark of Testimony. Whose testimony? Well, it's God's testimony to us, what he did, and it's your testimony to what he did. You see, we forget about it's your testimony because this is you. And inside you is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The Ten Commandments, the Golden Pot of Manna, and Aaron's Rod the Biddy. 
inside of you. And you're called to testimony. You're called to testify to that. You're called to speak out about that. Not called to hide it and whatever. You're called to speak out about it. If it's you, that becomes then a treasure chest. And before that, it sits, this whole, this whole setup sits inside you. In a, in, a, in a metaphorical way, it sits inside you. It, however, it, it, it's, uh, it's not covered, uh, this uh, ark is not covered with gold, okay? Now do it like this, okay? We have the, the, the brazen labor, which, uh, which incidentally, God lit, okay? In both cases, he lit the tabernacle of Moses, fire came down from heaven and lit the brazen labor. And also in uh, uh, David's uh, 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 temple, he came down from heaven and lit the brazen labor. God gives you the light. Before, it's all darkness. In the darkness, okay, in the darkness, you have this set up here, but you have no fire in, in the, in the, in the uh, brazen altar of sacrifice. And you have this set up here, uh, but you have no water in the, uh, 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 the uh, brazen labor of cleansing, okay? You have a candlestick, which is not lit, Okay, and you have a table of showbread with no showbread on it, and you have uh, uh, a, a altar of a prayer uh, which with no incense in it. Okay, which comes from here to here. The fire comes from there to there, and you have a, a, an ark inside you, which is not covered with gold, has nothing in it. Emptiness. If you're not saved. You're in darkness. Inside of you is a coffin waiting for you, and it's darkness. No light at all. That's what's waiting for an unsaved. That's in every single person ever living. God put this imprint of this, this thing in. And what he's asking for you to do is to receive Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And what happens then is the light comes down from God. <laughs> And lights the brazen labor. Oh, and then you get to water and a uh, 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 brazen altar, should say. You get water and, and the brazen labor, and you get uh, fire in the candlestick, and you get bread on the table of showbread, and you get incense in the table of incense, and you get God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost in a golden covered treasure chest. Because that's your treasure. That's your treasure. Now we'll go to the mercy seat. The mercy seat, Exodus chapter 25, verses 17 through 22. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Oh, pure gold. God again. Pure gold. Mercy seat. What does that mean, mercy seat? Let's look at our first footnote. <clears throat> In the Hebrew, it means a lid. A lid, that's a top, you know, on top of something. A lid, it comes from the root word, which means to cover, to expiate, or condone, to placate, or cancel, appease, make atonement, cleanse, disannul, forgive, be merciful, pardon, purge away, reconcile. Mercy. God has mercy on us. Why does it say those words? Forgive. We know that God forgives our sins, right? Why does it say pardon? Well, pardon is what we speak of when people who have been in jail or in, in, in prison, we speak they, they've been pardoned, right? Well, you are in jail and prison right now in your body. And you're being pardoned. You're being pardoned. All your sins are forgiven. Okay, uh, now expiate is an interesting word, so I went looked in a dictionary what expiate means. Footnote A, it means in dictionary to make satisfaction or atonement. To satisfy, because if you sin, you die. That's the penalty for sinning, okay? But if somebody else paid the price for that, your sin, you live. That's it. It means, expiate means to, to make satisfaction or atonement. It means to make amends or reparation, reparation for wrongdoing or guilt. It means to pay the penalty of. The penalty of our sin is death. But Jesus Christ paid that penalty. He paid that penalty, and now we're forgiven. 
Okay, that's what the mercy seat's all about. Okay, and that's what it means, mercy seat. Let's look at the mercy seat. What is it? What do you mean, mercy seat? Well, and they shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length of thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. That's exactly the size to cover the ark. Exactly the same size as the ark. It'll cover this whole ark perfectly. So I'll just set it there. Without somebody to get me, I think I might have some chalk. Okay, that's the mercy seat. It goes on top of the ark. What does that mean? That means you're forgiven. That means God has forgiven you. See, the ark is open on top, unless it has a covering. That's the covering. Your forgiveness has covered you. You, who are saved and born again, <clears throat> have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit inside you and you're forgiven you're forgiven and thou shalt make two cherubims the cherubims were angelic beings of gold of beaten work and beaten work means molded by hammering beaten out of one piece work they were one piece the same piece of this and you put them on either side so what we got here is out of this came Because the mercy seat and the two cherubims on both sides, cherubims are angelic beings, okay, who have wings, incidentally, okay, are either on both sides, but they're made out of the same piece here. Not different pieces attached to it, same piece. God made sure of that, okay. And what happens is these two angelic beings here are facing each other. They're facing each other, the Bible says, and their eyes are downward. They're looking at us. So I, I need, I need uh, the white. So, and they're looking at us. So if you're saved and born again, that's you. It's a treasure chest, okay? You're, you yourself are a walking, talking treasure chest. You are the ark. You are the ark because you have inside you God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost right there. And you're made out of shit and wood, or wood in the Bible, but wood with thorns. And But you're covered inside and out with gold. That's the purity of God. You're covered with gold inside and out, okay? And inside this treasure chest, you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And here, you have the mercy seat, which sits on top, which is forgiveness. And you are forgiven. Does that mean you don't sin? Nope. You still sin. We all sin, but hopefully not like we used to. And we're getting sinning less and less and less as we grow more and more and more into the Lord. Okay? But that's the promise for you. God is saying, metaphorically, okay, the title of today's message was a metaphorical description of your, your grave. That's your grave. That ain't that bad. If that's my grave and it's a treasure chest, and I've God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, knowledge of them inside me, and I'm forgiven. Man, that's a wonderful thing. But if I'm not saved, I'm not born again, all right, that means that I still have this chest here inside me, but it's made out of wood with no covering at all, no God covering at all, and inside of it 
is nothing and there's no cover at all. That means I'm a very lonely guy when it comes right down to it. If I'm not shaved, I'm a very lonely guy. Or girl as the case might be. Okay, we had two cherubims of gold of beaten work. Uh, thou shalt make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And one cherub on one of the end and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat, that's toward the testimony, the witness, the covenant, shall the faces of the cherubims be, and thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark. Put it above upon the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony, that's the witness, that's God's witness, that I shall give thee. And this is what he gave us. And there I will meet with thee. Look what God's saying now. And there, where? There I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee. Commune is more, more, more personal, more intense than just communicate. When I'm saying words, I communicate. When I'm making love, I'm communing. Like that for the two extremes, okay? And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. God's saying he's going to be sitting above the mercy seat, all right, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will commune with thee of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Where's God? I can't do anything but put an X here. Because I don't know what God is or looks like. But that's where he sits. And what is this then? We talk about God's throne in the Bible. You are God's throne. You are God's throne. And he sits above this, having done all this for you, and he communes with you. He talks to you. Now, you ain't listening lots of times. I mean, he talks to me. I still am not listening. I used to not listen at all. In fact, I used to not listen to anything about God. But now I listen. I don't hear everything he says, but he talks to me. He talks to everybody. Are you hearing from God, or are you just kind of like going your own thing? Are you saved and born again? Well, then you're hearing from God if you want to set that, let down your defenses and just, just listen. He will talk to you. But if you want to go your own way, and of course, if you're not saved and born again, you're not hearing anything except from Satan. He's talking to you all the time. Out through the television, radio, other people, talking to you all the time. And the point of all this is this. Testify. Testify. You're called to testify because you have, inside of you, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You're called to testify, to witness to all the world Exactly what's inside you. The Word of God. This right here is actually inside you. And you're called to witness to that. You're, that's your job, to testify. I can show you what Jesus commanded you to do that. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And he that Jesus said unto them, his disciples who are learners, pupils, and students, of which all of you which are, including me, go ye into all the world, Cos that's in the Greek cosmos, it means universe. And preach the gospel, the gospel is a gospel of love to every creature. <clears throat> that's you. You have a treasure chest inside you. You need, you need to understand that and believe that. Every person has this figure, this blueprint, let's put it like that. You have the blueprint of this inside you. Saved and unsaved alike. Where do we get the blueprint from? Well, because we used to be angels and we used to have that in, in us, working, okay? But we stopped.
being uh, we became fallen angels, which means, which means we lost our holiness, and now we don't have that uh, uh, capability anymore. But we have the blueprint still inside of us. The blueprint. And all we need is to get saved and born again. When we get saved and born again, the fire of God comes down and lights our brazen altar of sacrifice. And we're saved and born again. And then God, get, God gives us at the same time, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, he puts gold around us as protection. The Bible says that, that, that there's an angel about us, each of us, that, that, that guards and protects us. Does that in the Psalms, okay? That's a paraphrase. All right. He protects us with the gold around us and he forgives us because the seat settles it. Forgiven. We're forgiven. And God communes to us from between the two cherubim. That's in the Bible. Now, God, I didn't say that. You can't walk around with that line. He's crazy. He said this, that. No, no, I didn't say it at all. God said it. It's in the Bible. You can't tell me I'm wrong because I'm just repeating what God said. I'm interpreting some of the symbols for you so you can understand that. Because the whole Bible is all symbols. It's all symbolic. And if you don't understand the symbols, you can't apply them to what's happening in the Bible so you, you can't understand the stuff. So you have to understand the symbols. And you can't just understand them just like that. It takes some time. It takes some time, it takes some thought. You have to think about it. You have to think about God. It takes time. But your testimony, what God wants you to do, and that's exactly the same thing as what Gideon 300 did. They went up on top of the mountain surrounding the Midianites who were all unsaved people. And what they did is they preached the word of God. They said, the sword of the Lord, that's the Bible, and Gideon. Gideon is a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. They preached the word of God. That's how they won the war. We're going to lose the battle. We have battles all every day now. Christians are in battles every day. More and more is being taken away from us. More and more people are coming against Christianity. More and more and more. In fact, I just heard this morning before I came in California, uh, they passed a law uh, that uh, uh, they couldn't have church anymore. Period. Okay, but now what they've, they've mitigated that and uh, uh, also after, after they passed that law, actually passed that law and mitigated it to, now they can, well, they can have 25% of what they used to have. Uh, but they had an overruled the law. And, uh, but the point is this, they're coming after us. In the end, all the other things that are happening is Christianity that's being going to be, uh, how will I say, the enemy. And we are the enemy because we think differently than they do. We have a moral compass. They have none. Mm -hmm. They do whatever they want to do for power in this world. That's their God. Jesus, or that's her God, his name is Satan, okay? Power in this world. We're not looking for power in this world. We're looking for power in the next world. We answer to a higher authority. The higher authority is Father God. They answer to no one. It's all themselves. So, and they're gonna win the battle. All the battles that we're gonna have now, we're gonna have lots of battles, and they're winning, they've been winning all the battles, all right, starting with the, with the victory of the, of the election, and they will continue to win the battles and continue to diminish the United States of America, continue to diminish all the people, and eventually make them as socialistic slaves, okay? And, uh, and, and, uh, and win this battle, win this battle, and, and uh, uh, <clears throat> uproot this Christian over here and do this thing to that Christian. This church is going to be against Christians very soon, directly against Christians. But the point is this. They can win as many battles. It's like playing, playing the game of Risk, if any of you have ever played Risk. Okay? It's, a, it's for world domination. That's what the, the thing is all about. And you sacrifice some things to gain ground in other things, and you lose troops. But in the end, you win. We're going to lose lots and lots of troops. But in the end, we win. How do we know that? Well, God said so. In the end, we win. So we're going to suffer. And the suffering has already begun. We're going to suffer and suffer and suffer more and more and more. And that's going to be okay. And we're not called to do anything against that. 
We're not called to go take guns and go out there and fight somebody. We're not called to go out there and protest this and protest that, so on and so on. That's not what Christians are called to do. What Christians are called to do is testimony from the Ark of Testimony right here. We testify of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Just like the 300 successful warriors who incidentally, not a one of them got harmed and 100, of 135,000 Midianites, 120,000 of them died right there. They killed each other because all they were hearing is the word of God was confusing them and they killed each other. The word of God wins the battle. God always wins the battle. That's why Gideon started off. He, uh, he uh, called for called for, uh, from four different tribes, maybe a couple hundred thousand warriors, and 32,000 came. And what God did is he examined the 32,000, said, whoever's fearful and afraid, go home. That means if you don't believe God, go home. And two-thirds of them, 22,000, went home. Two-thirds of the church is like that. That's the church. Two-thirds of the church, the regular denominational church, are not believers. They're just there. They're not believers, and eventually they will leave. Because they'd be a lot safer if they weren't a Christian. And if we have one-third of the church will be left and suffer. But we win the war, and that's the whole deal. This is not a permanent thing. We're not going to be here forever fighting this war, okay, these battles all the time. That's not permanent. Permanent is going out and preaching the gospel to every creature, testifying, testifying to every creature in the universe. That's what we're designed to do. That's the purpose. Jesus Christ said in John 3, 3, he said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, what happens is, if, except you may be born again, that's a coffin. It's empty, it's full of darkness, and you're going to die. And that's the deal. And God said it. I didn't. He just said it so we could understand it. So, if you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I'm going to say a little prayer. You can raise your hand. And uh, you can say this prayer with me. I'll say it first, and you can say it after me. And if you do that, what will happen is that the light will shine in your life. There was a there was a there was a religion that I recently came across that believes that there is a light, a shining light, a fire in every person. Well, they're wrong, entirely wrong. They're one step away from being right, however, because <coughs> there is. The position for a shining light, but there is no shining light unless they receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, because he is the light of the world. In other words, that religion has gotten, gotten to the point where they understand there's a light, and the light is, well, they're a little shaky on Jesus Christ, but nevertheless, it's Jesus Christ, okay? But they don't understand that <coughs> they're only talking about saved people who have the light. I say people have no light at all. Complete darkness. That's what their Bible says as well as my Bible. You only get the light when you ask Jesus to come into your life. He's the light of the world. And he lights this, this blueprint that is stamped in every person. He lights it and you get the accruements to go with it. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Is there anybody here today who would like to say that prayer with me for the first time? Please raise your hand. I'll say that prayer with you for the first time. I expect that you're all then all saved and born again. I'm going to still say that prayer for the internet congregation. I don't know who's, uh, how many people. It's going into all the world, and it will be doing so after it's recorded uh, permanently on our website. It'll be doing 24-7 for the next how long ever before they take it off. Before it gets, what do they call it? Erased. We're in that kind of a culture now. If they don't like what you're saying, you get erased, okay? You stop to this, they stop that, you get erased, erased, erased. Eventually, they get around to us, okay? And we're small potatoes, you see, right now. And so, But eventually, they'll go through all the big potatoes, and then they get down to the small potatoes, and that's us, and that'll be gone. But in the meantime, we're on 24-7 throughout the entire world on, uh, 
uh, YouTube. So I'm going to say this prayer now. Now, uh, I've already taught, and I firmly believe that we are all fallen angels. Okay, If you're saved and born again, you're being restored back to your holiness, back to heaven. That's what that's what God says, and the spirit, the, your body is going to go into the dust, and your spirit will return to God who gave it. And God already said in in Psalm 104:4 that the angels are spirits. And He said it again in Hebrews 1:7. He said it twice. Angels are spirits. So you're a spirit, and you're either going to go to <laughs> you're an angel, <clears throat> and you're either going to go. It's a Bible in Ecclesiastes, uh, I think it's 12.7. Um, I'm not sure of that. That uh, the Spirit will return to God who gave it. Return. It, says, it doesn't say the Spirit will come to God. It says the Spirit will return, which means it had, had to have been there one time before, right? You can't return to some place you've never been. God says return. You're going to return. Those of you who are saved and born again are going to return. Those of you who are saved and born again, this is you directly. And you're going to heaven. And if you're not saved and born again, none of this counts except this box here, which is made out of wood, has no covering. It's a coffin. You're going to die and go to hell. That's the deal. Simple as that. That's what God says. That's what I'm telling you. If I'm wrong, correct me. I would love to be wrong. I would love that every person would go to heaven. That's what common is a common belief. Well, everybody, a good person, is going to go to heaven. No way. Even in the Old Testament, God said, and all their, all, all their goodness is, is, is rags before the Lord. So, now, if, being angels, you'd like to talk to God. I'd like those of you who would like to say this prayer with me to... to, to uh, for the people in the, in the congregation to please stand up and we'll say this prayer. If you don't want to say this prayer with me, then you're probably not saved. Don't worry about it. Okay? I'm, I have compassion on you, but there's nothing I can do about it. You heard the word. It's up to you. Okay, let's say this now, shall we? Father God, I confess I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid the penalty, and paid the penalty for, all for all my sins and was resurrected. And was resurrected. Thank, you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father God, Father God. Please, send your son, please send your son your fire, your fire. Into, my heart. into my heart to be the Lord, to the Lord. And, Savior and Savior of my life. Of my life. Thank, you, Thank you, Father God. Amen. Amen. Please be seated, please. We're going to take the tithes and offerings. Uh, Brian, come on up and take uh, ties and offices on one side and uh, uh, chant on the other side over here, okay? <laughs> no, you can't do that, honey. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Let me get that deal for you. And again, this is one of those things where it's real important what God says. He didn't say give to me. He said return to me your tithe. 10%, tithe is 10% of your profit uh, for the week or the month or since the last time you tithed, so on and so on. Okay, if you do that, what you're doing is you're showing God your obedience and you're yourself showing yourself the obedience. I can't, I don't know what you're doing. I, I, that's uh, not, 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 doesn't concern me. That's what you're doing now is between you and God. Okay, God, but you should know this. God blesses his obedient servants and he doesn't bless those who are disobedient. It's like having good kids and bad kids in your family. The good kids get the stuff. The bad kids get nothing. That's how it goes. So if you're, if you're happy with nothing, then uh, you know, don't bother. It's okay. Uh, God knows and you know. That's important. I'll take a moment to... Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, thank you for blessing us and saving us and loving us. And thank you, Lord, uh, oh, that you continue to just reveal yourself to us in these, the last days. Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. And I just ask that uh, your word go forth. Uh, your word says 
that it goes where you want it to go. And Lord, I ask that uh, you just bless all these people with more of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. One more last thing before we go. Uh, yes. Sally. Shailen, Shailen gets to preach. Okay. Yes, come on. You get, you get to bless the food. Amen. That was good. All right. God bless you. Hope to see you next week. God bless you. All right.